Well, good evening, family. We pray that you're doing well. We thank God for another opportunity to come together and study His Word. We thank God for this opportunity. I, I always pray for you and your family, and, and we're always thankful for each of you that take the opportunity to be a part of our weekly Bible study. I appreciate you, and I'm very grateful and very thankful to Almighty God. So as we get ready to go into the Word, I want you to uh, get a pencil. You can write down some of the scriptures that we're going to share with you and try to uh, keep up with Pastor as we we, we, sometimes we try to stay within the time frame, you know, but uh, nonetheless, we allow God to lead us. But if you have a pencil, write down with me, first of all, Revelations chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Revelations chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Psalms 91, verse 11. Psalms 91, verse 11. And then let's look at Luke chapter 4. Verse 28 through 32, Luke 4, 28 through 32, Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, and finally, John chapter 10, verse 10, John chapter 10, verse 10. And you, hopefully you, you can take an opportunity, and pause, and, 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 and find all of those verses. And if you got little stick em notes or whatever you might use, you can mark them. So as we go through the lesson, you can follow us scripture by scripture and text by text. Okay, let us have a word of prayer. Father, we come in the very precious name of Jesus. We thank you for an opportunity to study your word. We invite the precious Holy Spirit to come and fellowship with us, guide us and lead us and direct us as we give God the glory and the praise and the honor. So we thank you, Holy Spirit. We extend to you our personal invitation. Let you know you are so welcome. We ask that you teach this Bible study and you would feed us is our prayer. In Jesus' name. All right, now we've been still dealing with angels, and, and mostly last week we dealt specifically with Lucifer, who was an archangel in heaven, and realized that he himself got kicked out of heaven down to this planet, and he brought some other angels with him. Now, once they arrived upon this earth, they're no longer referred to as angels, they're referred to as demons. Because they have an agenda that goes against God. So we look at that. And we realize that Paul told us. He says, listen. You know, uh, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not coming against just people in, in, in the natural. No, no, no. We are in a war against demonic spirits. They're demons. Not only is the, they're the devil, but they're demons which he has with him on this planet. And even though we can't see them, as Pastor said before, you might think your life is just monotonous and boring, but realize the enemy is always there. He's always looking for an opportunity to deceive or to attack us. So I, I want to bring something out in the scripture. And when you look at Revelations chapter 12, verse 7, it says, there was war in heaven. Sounds ironic, doesn't it? How can there be, in a place like heaven, how can you have war? Well, you remember the enemy was lifted up with pride. Satan himself wanted to be as God. 
he said that he would be lifted up when you read in the book of Ezekiel. And he wanted to be God. He wanted to take God's place. Uh, he was an anointed sheriff. You know, he, he was per se the, the worshiper leader in heaven. But he got beside himself and that wasn't enough. He actually wanted to take the throne from God. So we see here that even in heaven, he convinced other angels. And that is really mind-boggling for pastor. Because here they are in a very, very special place. They're in heaven. We know we're all trying to get to heaven. These angels and Lucifer are already there. And now there's a rebellion. There's a war. So Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the angel fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. You know, once he revealed his hand, his his stay in heaven was over. He was he's about to be evicted from heaven down to this earth. Now, verse nine, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And that's my emphasis tonight. If I could title this lesson of Bible study, you know, I would call it the deceiver, the deceiver, Satan, the deceiver. He deceiveth not partial uh, of some of the world, but the Bible says the whole world. So his method of operando, his, 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 his greatest dis, uh, method to come against us as we wrestle with them is to deceive us. And the Bible says he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. But keeping in mind, his greatest method, his greatest weapon, his greatest tool is to deceive us. So we cannot be ignorant of his devices, his schemes. He is a conniver. He is an imposter. Yes, and he looks to deceive us. How many people have been deceived over and over again? How many people are so vulnerable to his deception? Look at what's, what's permeating across this whole nation, our whole country. We see the, the deception is widespread. It's, it's so deep. So we really realize and we can really see that he truly is pouring out this, 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 you know, this deceptive type of atmosphere across the entire nation. There are people that still believe things that's hard to believe. There are people who are still deceived and, and but they still they don't even believe in the current presidency. They don't even believe in, 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 in the one who is currently in office. So we see that he is indeed a deceiver. So his schemes and his 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 devices we are not ignorant of. So what we have to be alert and on our toes with is how is he trying to deceive? Now, to be deceived is to be duped, is to be fooled, baited, hoodwink, lured, to be conned, just simply taken advantage of. But one of the main focus I want you to realize about being deceived is ultimate goal is to lead us into an erroneous conclusion. It is to bring us to the wrong conclusion. See, once you conclude on a matter, once you come to a specific conclusion, in your mind, that's settled. So the danger of a deceiver and his ultimate objective and goal is to lead us into an erroneous conclusion. Now, that's what happened. And I want you to see this as we go through with the scriptures, that, that, that little thread. He's trying to get us to come to an erroneous conclusion. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Eve is in conversation with the devil. And he is getting her to question God's word about what he said about the tree of good and evil. For look what he says. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's lying to her, all right? He's trying to get her, he's trying to lead her to an erroneous conclusion. 
God gave her the truth. He told her what exactly would happen. But the purpose and job of the enemy now is to get her to go to an erroneous or come to an erroneous conclusion. And verse 6, and when the woman saw, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that, you know, that's very um, powerful. It's, it's very important to learn that somehow he got her to come to an erroneous conclusion by totally seeing totally different from what God had spoken. God told her what not to do, that the tree was was not good to touch or to eat from. But now, through his deceptive practices, we see that Satan has gotten her to see something that is good. Yes, her whole perspective about the tree has changed. Her whole pers perspective on what God has said, simply because the power of deception, the power of a lie, lets us see that it, everything has changed. Nothing has changed. And let me say that again. If you, we know you wish you could tap Eve on the shoulder and say, Eve, wait a minute. What God said is still true. What God said is still in force. Nothing has changed. And that's what we have to watch out and be aware of. One of the purpose, as we even go through this season, as we go through this uh, time that we're in, with this pandemic and, and isolation, and, and huh, you have to realize nothing has changed. God still loves you. Your status with him is still a son or daughter of God. It doesn't matter about the hardship or, or, or sometimes the things that we have to suffer because the Bible teaches us those who live godly shall suffer persecution. So we have to be aware. Yeah, we have to, we, we can't not be deceived. We cannot fall in the same trap that Eve did. The enemy stayed with it. He stayed there long enough to get her to see something totally different than what God has said. And we have to watch out for that same method. All right? We don't want the enemy to get us to see or, or, or disbelieve or to doubt God's word. Because what God said is true. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away before one word. One word fails. So we know God's word will stand. Matter of fact, everything we see, everything that we experience, everything that we can touch and perceive and, and feel with our senses is simply a product of God's word. All God had to do was speak and everything came into existence. So think about the power of that. He gave her other words. He gave her different words long enough so that she would be able to see what God said differently. And you and I, we have to be very careful. What God said is what God said. And he's, what he said is true. And we have to realize they lost everything due to an erroneous conclusion that the enemy allowed her to see. And what Pastor said too, here they are, they're about to lose everything. Because remember, the power of a lie is that if you believe it, you will live it. If you believe it, you will be guided by it. If you believe it, you'll follow it. And look across this nation. Can't you see, family, the deceiver is running loose. People are believing different things. They are going, I mean, it's, it's just so desperate now in our nation for the truth. People need it so desperately. And I, I just, I think about uh, a, a lie. If you believe it, you can live it. And this is why in the, in the lives of couples, strife is, is something that you should avoid. You should watch out for don't allow strife to come in because your prayers are hindered. And don't allow, it's been a long time since we've met as married couples. I know that this is specifically for the married couples. But but be aware of the enemy. You know, we have time together and things like that. Be aware. Don't allow him to cause you to come to an erroneous conclusion about your spouse, about your mate. Don't allow him to do that. He's subtle. He's sneaky. Yes. And you think about divorce sometimes. Divorce is so devastating, especially if you've been married a long, long time. It makes you think that all the while, 
all you have been leaving, all you have been living, has been nothing but a lie. And see, you know the devil is a liar. But 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 when people are frustrated, when people let strife come in, when the enemy eases in, yes, he 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 he'll whisper to you, he'll talk to you. Uh huh. Yeah. And 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 a lot of couples during this time, during this season, are experiencing pressure and stress, and that they are not aware of. And if they're not careful. If you're not careful, the enemy can come in. And, and, and cause you to see your spouse totally different. See your spouse totally in an erroneous way that God never intended for you to do so. So he's sneaky family. He's subtle. And, and, and you have to always be on guard. And don't let him cause you to come to an erroneous conclusion. Now, we go back to the situation where Jesus was tempted. Especially in the Gospel of chapter, of chapter 4 of Matthew, St. Matthew. Remember when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the enemy? He was led to be tempted by the devil. But I want you to catch something. Really pay a close, close attention to it. Beginning at verse 5, St. Matthew verse four, chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, now the devil has elevated Jesus, and he says something to him, If thou be the Son of God, there's that word again, if, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Isn't this powerful? This ought to make some uh, lazy Christians uh, uh, go on alert. We see here that the enemy is quoting scripture to Jesus, who is the word made flesh. He's telling Jesus what's written. And he's quoting from Psalms 91. But the thing you have to remember is this, is that he has read the Bible. That's obvious. If he's able to quote scripture, not only has he read it, but he has memorized it what he's read. Yes. So look at the advantage he has over so many Christians who don't take the time to get into God's word, who don't take the time to, to meditate in God's word, who don't take the time even to, to, to participate in Bible study, perfecting class, and whatever. Look at the obvious advantage that he has already by simply doing what he does. He, he, he comes back at Jesus from the perspective that if you be the son of man, uh, you can jump, jump off this temple, jump off this pinnacle, because it's written, you know, that, hey, it says in the Bible, it's in the book, that, you know, his angels will bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. But what he did, he is literally misquoting scripture. So misquoted scripture can also be dangerous. Scriptures taken out of context can be dangerous. If you leave something out of the scripture, that can be dangerous. If you add something to the scriptures, that also can be dangerous. And what he did was this. He left out something with the scriptures. If you look at Psalms 91, verse 11, Psalms 91, verse 11, this is what he quoted. He said, for he shall give his angels charge over thee. Right. But the part he left out was right following that to keep thee. In all thy ways. And that's very important. To keep thee in all thy ways. So you're not tempting the Lord. And, 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 and when you're going about your business. Doing the will of God. You will be kept in all of your ways. You won't be able to be harmed. You won't be able to be uh, uh, taken out early. Because you are literally being kept in all your ways. I can reflect back as a teenager. I thank God. Here I am, you know, I have reached senior citizen status. But I look back at all the opportunities the devil tried to take me out. Yes. And it looks like I was, you know, just trying to participate with him and help him. 
especially at that motorcycle. And you heard Pastor talk about all the motorcycle accidents. I mean, there, there's, there's no nice way to have an accident, especially on a motorcycle. There's nothing between you and the pavement. But, but accident after accident, first accident, waking up underneath the car with the lady's muffler blowing me in the face that woke me up. And, and here I am, fine, nothing, no broken bones, nothing. You know, uh, next accident, sliding on the highway, 55 miles per hour, me and my friend rolling on the highway. And the motorcycle was behind us, coming, chasing us. And we're on the road, hitting, rolling on the pavement, and the motorcycle is coming behind us. He shall keep thee in all thy ways. Little did I know, I was being kept because God had a purpose for my life. Not knowing that as a 17-year-old a teenager, that listen, the reason you can get up from each accident and walk away is because God has his angels there to keep you in all your ways. Now, if I just go out there and do something foolish and stupid, you know, no. No, that's not God's purpose. The purpose is to keep us in all our ways. And that's why we have to realize uh, there's the enemy, he's been deceptive. He's bringing people to an erroneous, and that's the point I want you to get, an erroneous conclusion. You have to know. Look at the nation. Uh, look at where we are a third year with the pandemic. You know why? Because he has given people, he has allowed the enemy, the, the, the deceiver, has caused people to come to an erroneous conclusion when it comes to mass. An erroneous conclusion when it comes to being vaccinated. An erroneous conclusion when it comes to anything that's happening. You know, uh, so, so you have to be very careful, very careful. You have to know what God has spoken to you. Now, if God speaks to you about a certain situation, there's nothing that we can say about that. We can't do anything about that. But Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You up here asking me to jump. You want me to jump. You know, no, no. Hey, he shall keep thee in all thy ways. So that's the thing. As we go our daily lives, as we go through living, just life itself, you can go through not tempting the Lord, not trying to say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this to prove something. No. As you just go through life, God keeps us from dangers seen and dangers unseen. He upholds us. The enemy tries to take us out. We can look back over our lives and we can truly say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be? And I can come to that same conclusion. So we realize here, the enemy wanted Jesus to prove something. And you make sure as we go through this pandemic, you know whatever God has told you to do, then you be you be aware of what God has spoken to you. You know, you know, there, you know, there's some agree with different things and some don't agree with different things and so forth. But but I'm aware of what has been spoken to my heart. So I'm not going to allow the enemy to cause me to come to an erroneous conclusion. Can somebody say amen? So Jesus said, don't tempt them. You don't tempt the Lord that God. And I want you to realize that we have to always be cognizant of the fact his, he is a deceiver. And his ultimate goal is to lead us to an erroneous conclusion. He performed it on Eve to the point where she was there. And he's trying to do the same thing to us. So I want you to Hear something. Now, next point I want you to see here too. That kind of support that he, the Lord will keep thee in all thy ways. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 4. Verse 28 through 32. Luke chapter 4 verse 28 through 32. And all they in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath. Jesus was teaching. Telling the spiritual leaders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, revealing things about them to the point where they got totally upset. They were hot. They, this is, has now become a very heated uh, discourse between Jesus and these leaders. And guess what they did? Verse 29, Luke 4, 29. I want you to understand. They arose up and thrust him out of the city. 
Can you imagine them grabbing hold to Jesus, throwing, pushing him out of the city? And guess where they're taking him? They're leading him to the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built. Now think about Satan. Satan took Jesus up to a, a temple, uh, a pinnacle, and told Jesus, jump. God, you know, he shall give his angels charge over thee. Jump. Just jump. My Lord, you have to know what God has spoken to your heart. If God says to, to do this, you do that. If God says not to, then you don't. But his purpose and deceitfulness is to try to get us to operate on our own. To, to go out on our own, to do something, to try to prove something. A lot of church people, um, uh, they are part of that number that comes up, you know, of those who are deceased. And, you know, you, you know we know, you say, Pastor, everybody has an appointed time. Uh, I understand that. That's true. But the Bible says we don't have to leave here before our time. So we have to make sure that when we make a decision, when we come to a conclusion, it's not an erroneous conclusion. That's the ultimate goal of the enemy. And I want to drive that point home. He's deceiving. He wants people to come to the conclusion that's totally erroneous. And here we find out that sure, his angels will keep thee, but they will keep thee in all thy ways. Not, not when you just made up something or thought up something or, or uh, you know, don't agree with something. You have to be sure you've heard from God. And that God is leading you and guiding you and directing you. So here they are. They took Jesus and led him to the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. So here they have Jesus in their grips. They're mad. These men are mad. They're, 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 they got hatred in their hearts. And this is a crowd of people that is pushing Jesus. You know, Jesus being pushed, he's being pushed to the edge of a cliff. They want to push him off this cliff. He's been pushed to an edge of a cliff. My Lord, Jesus can't die this way, family. He is scheduled to die on the cross on Calvary, Golgotha. So what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish will not come to fruition. Because this is not part of Jesus' agenda. And guess what happened? Here they are. They have Jesus in their grip. They're leading him to the edge of the hill. They're getting ready to throw him off this cliff headlong. They want him to dash to pieces. But look at verse 30. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. That key, that's key. He passing through the midst of them went his way. Why, God, my God, isn't it wonderful to know that as long as you have something, something that God intends for you to do, something that God has intended for you to do. That's why I talk to so many of you, and I'm, I'm so grateful for each of you. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for those that God has made a part of, of our church family, those who are actively involved in, in keeping the church going and, 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 and helping to sustain the church during this pandemic. Because let me tell you something. You know, as long as you're doing something and you have something to do for the Lord, the old folks knew it. They couldn't, they didn't know everything, but they knew only what you do for Christ will last. So don't think that what you do, even, even in how you support uh, the ministry, support AGC in the church, as long as there's something for you to do, the enemy cannot take you out. And here they had Jesus getting ready to throw him over the cliff. I and mean, we see right here that Jesus came, walked, turned, and walked through the midst of them. Because Psalms 91 is true. He's given his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. So don't misquote it, devil. Don't misquote it now. If you're going to shout, shout the scriptures, say everything. Say the whole text. Say the whole scripture. Don't, don't, don't quote the part that you want to quote and, and leave out some stuff. And that's exactly what he's, he did. So one of his chief strategies against Jesus now was to quote scriptures. He's read the book. So you make sure now that he has not used even scriptures out of context 
even scriptures that are misquoted to have you come to the wrong conclusion. The wrong conclusion. Oh yeah, now you you know you know that yeah I, I got it now. Uh, no no no. You be careful now that you make sure nothing but the truth and the whole truth is what you've used to come to your conclusion. And the enemy he is a deceiver. But isn't that powerful? We get to see here that as a result of the angels keeping Jesus, they could not throw him off this cliff. He just turned around and hide in the world. He just, the Bible said, and he walked through the midst of them. He just simply walked out and went his way. So when you have an agenda, when you are doing something for Christ, when you, let's say you're involved in the church, like says a ministry or your whatever, your, your purpose is what keeps you. Yes, your purpose is what sustains you. Yes, your purpose is what will help guide you and lead you. And as Pastor said time and time again, I'm grateful. I am very thankful, you know, that I, I, I play a part in God's kingdom. And you do also. When you click on and you come and, and, and you are a part of the Bible studies in the perfected class, you play a part. You play a very special part. It's encouraging for pastors. Uh, and, and co -path. it's just encouraging that we can look out and see that there are listeners. There's someone who's here. There's someone who's taking the time. So you are an encouragement to God. And you're not only an encouragement to God, but you're an encouragement to God's servant. So think about that. Hallelujah. They had him in their clutches. They were going to throw him over the cliff. And all of a sudden, Jesus turned around and walked through the midst of them. And that's the point I want you to get and understand. A pastor Reeves could not die in those motorcycle accidents, even though I am on a motorcycle against cars. I'm, I'm on a motorcycle against hard pavement. I'm on a motorcycle being slung in the air and all these different things and racing like something silly. But, I, but here I am, nothing broken, nothing broken, family. Not just the one, nothing but why? Because he has given his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. That's why you ask God for something to do. You, you seek his purpose. You seek his will. And whatever he currently has to do, whatever you can do, whatever you do, whatever you can do for Christ, that is a clue. That helps, sustains us. It helps to keep us. Yes. And what you're doing now as part of our family, and I believe with all my heart, is part of the purpose to make sure that God's word and his purpose and the ministry will continue to go forward. So God is a good God. So, so we see here, he passed through the midst of them and went his way. And look away, what happened. He, verse 31, And he came down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. Verse 32, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. So he had, Jesus said, I'm, I'm, where, where are you going? I'm going to do some more teaching. I'm going to share the word. And the people received it, and they were, they were amazed. They were astonished by the fact that his words had power. His words had power with them. So he knew right then that there was something uh, uh, that God intended for him to do. Now, like I said, you be careful. The enemy wanted him to come to a conclusion that he could prove something. Jump. Jump. Jesus, God, word says he's going to catch you and angels and all this. Jump. No. That was not part of the ways that God had planned for him. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And in the same instance, people who have him can't even push him off the cliff. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, so we have to realize that his ultimate goal is to deceive us, to come to an erroneous, an erroneous conclusion. His ultimate goal is to deceive us, family. And we have to keep that in mind. Can you say amen? That's why we have to realize, you, you know, he, notice this too. He we realized that he could not physically, now the enemy, the devil could not physically throw Jesus off either. 
The devil could not physically push him off, but the devil himself could not physically throw Jesus off. So we have to realize the only thing he can do is, is try to master the art of persuasion. That's why we have to realize, family, as we come to the close of this Bible study. When you look at Romans 8.35, Paul says something. As we go through life, we have to be fully persuaded by things. Yes, we have to be fully persuaded. Yes, because everything won't be always comfortable and everything won't always be uh, just the way we want them. Yes, yeah, but we do know that Paul calls everything that we might experience or go through. He says these are light afflictions because the glory that shall be revealed in us and to us and conferred upon us is far greater than any suffering that we'll do in this lifespan. So Romans 8.35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Say that with me. Say more than conquerors in your present status. What do you look like? What has the enemy told you? What has he convinced you? Why do you have the lone face? Why are you going through what you're going through? Why are you experiencing? What? What? Why are you depressed? Why? What's going on? You, you, you got to be fully persuaded that you must understand no matter what you're facing, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your situation, we are more than conquerors. We are champions. We are not victims. We are victors. So you have to ask yourself. He said, he said, nay, in all these things, talk to us, Paul. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. And there we go. That's the key. Are you really persuaded? That's the question that I can't answer for you, you know, because you remember some seeds sown on the wayside, you know, some seeds fell among thorns and, and the thorns references the, the, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches come up and choke the word. So every time this word goes forth, every time pastor teaches or shares, it depends on the condition of your heart, the condition of what fruit will, will, will spring forth. So you've got to be fully persuaded that you won't allow circumstances to alter what you believe. You won't let the devil give you circumstances and situations that would lead you to an erroneous conclusion. So he said, I am persuaded. He said that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So look at it. He put Satan right on there. Satan, prince, nor angels. That's, that's the devil. Thank you, Paul. He said, no, I'm persuaded. I know how he works. We're not ignorant of his devices. And I am fully persuaded. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So remember, remember, family, he is a thief, and he cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's John 10.10. 10. Let's us know that he is the master of deception. He wants to lead us, just like he did Eve. She saw what was good, what God said was bad. She, he, through his deception, he got her to come to an erroneous conclusion. Yes, so you have to be very careful. He even used the word, the word of God, but he left stuff out taking stuff out of context to try to get Jesus to do something, to try to get Jesus to jump, suicide, Can, you know, give it up, give up. No, no, no. Uh -uh. Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Yes, family. So we have to make sure that we have come to a conclusion, proud for you, happy for you. Yes, but wh where are you? 
What have led you to this place? What brought you here? Why are you here? It's like Jesus, when he looked for Adam, uh, the Lord, that is, he said, Adam, where art thou? And is he asking you the same question? Where are you? Sure, we're all going through this. We're all going through the same circumstances. Some of our circumstances are different than others, but we have to be fully persuaded. The, the, the deceiver wants us to be led to the wrong conclusion. Just like Adam and Eve lost everything because he led them, he persuaded them to come to the, an erroneous conclusion. And we're not going to fall victim to that. Amen. Amen. So, so where are you right now? Mm -hmm. Where are you right now? What are you going through right now? Where's your joy right now? Where's your happiness? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a thief family. God wants you to know that I have come. That they might have life. What about a pandemic, Lord? It doesn't matter. That they might have life. Lord, what about scarcity of stuff? Doesn't matter. That they might have life and have it more abundantly. And one translation says, until it overflows. My God, my God. So regardless of what we're going through, we need to be diligent and sober and watchful because the, 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 the purpose of the enemy would be to try and get us to be led to the wrong conclusion, an erroneous conclusion. And if we do so, we can find ourselves in a place where God does not want us to be. Amen. But please make sure, check yourself. Just check where you are right now. Check your heart. Check your joy level. Check your peace. Check your love. Check where you are right now. Make sure that the subtle enemy, the devil, has not snuck in and has now led you to an erroneous conclusion. Amen. He's a deceiver and he's a liar. God bless you. Well, we love you, family. I want to take this time and thank you for being a part of pastor. As I said before, those things we do for Christ will last. Yes. And, 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 and those things we do for Christ, as you support the ministry, as you, as you support the teachings and so forth, we're grateful. We are so grateful. We are thankful. And remember, it, it might not look like a big purpose, but it's still something that you're doing for the Lord. And as long as you have something to do for the Lord, hey, God will make sure that your time upon this planet will always be prolonged. They couldn't even throw Jesus off the cliff because Jesus still had things to do on behalf of the Lord. So God is good. And I pray that he will continue to keep you, watch over you, and take care of you. We love you. May God bless and keep you. God bless.